Assalamu alaikum guys <laughs> Welcome to this very very important episode of Smile to Jannah It's important because the champ is in it Huh? It's important because I'm in it It's not because you have just said it's important People need to understand the levels in this game Oh thank you very much That's a Jannah This is in secondary schools, we've heard parents yeah. complaining, we've heard students complaining that the RE teachers are mostly agnostic and atheist. They are using those sessions yes, to know. forward their propaganda uh, or their... How do you explain atheism like it's uh, something with corrigible principles? Yes. Something that's unproven from first principles. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Right. Something that let's just say is illogical to say the least. It's a paradox in itself. Well, you're just using big words now, aren't you? I am. A slobber de gullion. Timorous, pusillanimous, ultra crepidarian, dilettante. But are they correct though? <laughs> <laughs> if they're coming from your mouth, then they're not correct. Oh, oh a coin! I think the first thing we would say before we even delve into some of the common questions and I would say this video needs to be spread to all these students, all these parents because Alhamdulillah you know we are experienced hijab more so, much more so than me so I'm going to posit these questions to him and the first thing you need to do if this is happening with the RE teacher they should not be doing this sort of stuff, they shouldn't be biased yeah, and the parent should come together, complain, have a meeting with the head teacher. Let's jump into it. Number one, yeah. evidence of God. God is instinctively realized. And I think most neuroscientific research has shown that now. Like we, we quote research from Justin Barr. I think it's probably the best. Um, okay, you said instinctively realized. Yeah, so you're yeah. talking about instinct. You're yeah. talking about something so that's I th innate. I th we should start with that. I think we should start with the fact that it's there are some things which are pretty much instinctively realized we can we can assert now based on the evidence of cognitive science neuropsychology that young people growing up uh, babies born as soon as they have been able to kind of perceive the outside world have been and shown to be uh, believing in a higher power okay so that's from Justin Barrett University of Oxford yeah yeah all right so that's one thing the other thing is that there's a range of different uh, evidences and arguments that can be used. I think if we're talking about, f for me personally, if we're talking about young people now, I would use a abbreviated type of the fine tuning argument, which is connected to the contingency argument, which I've obviously written a book about. Uh, how would I do that? Because the contingency argument might be a bit of a mouthful and a bit difficult for young people. So I'll just say this. I'm going to link a, a video in the description if you want to know more about the contingency because he's doing his PhD on that. We have a lot of experience and mashallah the contingency is the argument that is flawless. We think, yeah. I personally believe it's the strongest per, uh, yeah. argument. I want to arm young people with three fundamental questions. Okay. And this is these are counter questions that you can ask your teacher and or other colleagues and students in the class. Number one, why is there something rather than nothing? Okay, or how could it be the case that there is something rather than nothing? Because it is significant that there is something rather than nothing. Mm. That something exists rather than nothing exists. Yeah, that is something which is clearly significant because it acts as a basis for everything else. Yes. The second thing I would put is I'd say what are the things that we know about this universe? Mm. Okay, we know that this universe exists. Correct. Okay, no problem. Uh, we know that this universe has life. Now, the, based on these points, how do you explain that there is life in this universe? How, how is it explicable? How is it explainable that there is life in this universe? If one says, well, it's not explicable, that's a cop-out. That's not an answer to the question. The third thing is then, what is the best explanation for there to be uh, life in this universe? So here, here's questions that we're putting forward. They're not necessarily arguments so far. Okay. Are, because a question really cannot be wrong. It can have a wrong presupposition. Mm. But you can't have a wrong question. So by asking the question, we are reframing the discourse here. And you're also putting yourself in the driving seat as we're, well. We're you're on not the not driving just, seat. Yeah. We're on the driving seat. Yeah. Of the options that you have, what are the best options 
for the explanation of existence rather than non-existence, A, and B, life rather than non-life in the universe. Now, in order for the universe to have life rather than non-life, it has to have be finely tuned in a certain way. Now, most atheists actually agree with this. They call this the fine-tuning of the universe. And they talk about gravitational constant, the electromagnetic constant, all these kind of things, that they're fine-tuned in a certain way. I'm not even talking about all of that. I'm just saying that it's a fact that the universe is is uniform, stable, and regular. and regular. These are three things about the universe, such that science can be done in the first place. Therefore, the universe is regular, uniform, and stable enough to, f to be fine-tuned for life, to exist in the universe, what explains this? There are three options. Option one, that nothing explains this. Mm. So nothing created the universe, so nothing created something, yeah. which is an impossible option because we say from nothing, nothing comes. It's impossible, yeah? We say something explains this. This something is weak, dependent, and unintelligent. But then how do you explain the fact that the universe is fine-tuned and that itself is dependent upon something which is dependent. Mm. Problematic, yeah? Mm. So we're saying the third option is that this thing is necessary, which means everything depends upon it, and it depends upon, it's independent, mm. and it has knowledge. Mm. So of the three options in this trichotomy, which of the three makes most sense? You can choose yourself. If you think that there is a fourth option, please present it. Yeah. If there is no fourth option, then uh, then choose the right answer or forever hold your peace. It's a very clever way of cornering somebody because for them to say that the universe came from nothing, they'd have to be committing all kinds of logical fallacies, that the universe depends on another universe, which is dependent. Then we have the problems of the infinite regress. We have all kinds of issues. Therefore, we need something which everything depends upon and it depends upon nothing, but which also has intelligence. But is it only have intelligence and necessity, or does it also have the ability to change the situation? If we say it can, it has the ability to change the situation because the, the world is changing, the universe is changing, that must mean it's also got ability. So it has power. Because the universe has power inside of it, it requires a generator. And so you can already extract what we refer to as the classical attributes of God. <laughs> so number two, so how do you know that the Prophet ﷺ existed and was who he said he was? Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, how would you answer this? The Prophet ﷺ um, is somebody whose existence can be verified by non-Muslims. Yeah, dated back to that time with documents that have been dated to that time, whether it's carbon dated or any other way. Yeah. So the first one is seventh century. It's called the Nestorian uh, Chronicle. Number two is called the Doctrina Jacobi Nupa Baptizati, and the third one is Bishop Sabius of the House of Bagratunis. Yeah. So these are three sources. You can find these in a book by Abu Zakaria called Forbidden Prophecies. I think the strongest uh, thing as well is the Quran itself. I mean, it mentions the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from whence did it come? You know, and you've got obviously all these Sahaba, the Tabain, Atba Tabain, all these companions, the wives of the prophets. There's very solid historical existence of all of these things the Kaaba itself coins that date back to the Umayyad period which has the name Muhammad on it you know all kinds of uh, things where Islam proliferated uh, in the Arabian Peninsula uh, in all different types of place and where the mention of the Prophet Muhammad was everywhere I think the reason why a lot of kind of Orientalist and this is what it is, bro. I mean, Orientalist, uh, Eurocentric uh, scholars and uh, historians, revisionists, they're called revisionists, they don't accept the existence of the Prophet Muhammad, which is a very minority, small minority mm, of yeah. people, um, if negligible to say the least, yeah. is because they don't accept the uh, the accept they don't accept the uh, Arab script they don't accept historical uh, records from written in anything other than the white man's languages yeah that's why they'll they'll rubbish African history they'll they'll rubbish any type of oral history they'll rubbish Middle Eastern history they may even rubbish Chinese uh, history mm. uh, because if it's not written in the in the handwriting and in the language and the preferred methods of the white man yeah they don't accept it so yeah, we don't we, we're not we're not here to you know placate you know to these individuals and i think sometimes it's good to have it's definitely good to have these uh, sources which are roman sources really yeah uh non-muslim extra 
Quranic sources, but do we need all of them anyway? We don't. All right, so there's there's loads of other books. You're mentioning coins and stuff like that. There's there's one book that I was looking at by Sean Anthony in which he actually documents the coins as well, and he documents certain manuscripts that they found that has the hijra on it. Yeah, it's dated with the Islamic calendar of the hijra. Now, there's many presuppositions you can take. Number one, the fact that you've got documents that are dating to that time. Number two, the fact that the hijra took place. If the hijra took place, then of course you're verifying the presence of uh, firstly Umar radiallahu an, then secondly Abu Bakr and the Prophet. So again, there's other okay. things. Oh, 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 I mean, I don't think historians doubt that. I mean, how did Jerusalem get conquered? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the the thing is, there's demographic details here. Yeah. Like d Jerusalem fell to the to the Muslim to the Muslim Empire, and that was under the time of Umar al-Khattab. Uh, unless you want to say that Jerusalem didn't fall, and it didn't happen in Amr al time, and that such a man didn't exist. But then how do you explain the existence of Muslims in Jerusalem today? How do you explain the uh, the fact that Islam proliferated to these places? It's, it's a pathetic and appalling argument that really is um, carries no weight whatsoever. But what I find really interesting, bro, more interesting than potentially all I've just mentioned, is that you'll find people that attack the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Mm. I'm not mention their names. Yeah. There, there are people who attack the Prophet Muhammad Sallam and other places they say he didn't exist. So if he didn't exist, then why are you attacking him? It's like attacking mm -hmm. the, the fairy monster or yeah, yeah. The, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the boogeyman. The boogeyman. Yeah. You know, or the Hulk or something, which is me. But uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but you're Bruce Banner, isn't it? Who's that again, bro? He's the skinny one that turns into the Hulk. <laughs> are you the Joker? <laughs> <laughs> you're damn right. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, and uh, talking about the veracity of the Prophet, this is a technique that we use in Speaker's Corner, which is to talk about the prophecies of the Prophet. Yeah, there's a book by, again, Abu Zakaria, Forbidden Prophecies, where it goes through other people that have made prophecies, like the likes of Nostradamus, the Mayans, the Qi Ching, or Qing, whatever they are. With these people, their prophecies are very vague. Mm. There's always explanation to how they could have known. Things don't add up, but the Prophet's prophecies... All of them uh, have hit the nail on the head. In fact, you mentioned one of C.S. Lewis. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Yeah. And it implies that the, the end of the world is going to be imminent. Yeah. And so C.S. Lewis looked at that verse and he said, and C.S. Lewis, for those who don't know, he's like one of the top scholars in uh, Christian history. Mm. And he said that it's, it's the most embarrassing verse in the Bible because no. it didn't come true. That's a high level scholar, isn't it? Very high level scholar, probably top five in the last hundred years. With with regards to the veracity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his claim to be a prophet, would you say, uh, what else would you say other than prophecies? Well, I, the way I divide it is into necessary and sufficient conditions. Yeah. So necessary conditions are conditions which if they are not there, yeah. then the person or the claimant uh, is nullified from the very beginning. Okay. And okay. things which are necessary is the preservation of the text. If we don't have preserved a preserved Quran, yeah. which is the same uh, Quran which has been uh, emitted to the people of that time, the end user, and we have a different type of Quran, or has been uh, different differences have been put in, or something like that. Mm. The narrative has been changed, or whatever it may be. Then it, it means that we have different access to guidance. That the first people have different access to guidance to the people that come afterwards. And if it's meant to be a universal religion, this is a real problem. It's a yeah. catastrophe, in fact. And this is what we have seen in the biblical discourse. There are there are literal verses. There are three that bear the the, the um, uh, witness in heaven: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all these three are one, which have literally been seen as forgeries hmm. in the biblical discourse wow. and been taken out by other Bibles. There is no example of that at all of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that. For a thousand four hundred years, the Quran, with all of its qiraat and all of its recitational uh, formats, have been read in exactly the same way for a thousand four hundred years, and that's a fact. The narrative has not changed. We have not seen verses come in and out like that. There's no comparison between it and the Bible, biblical discourse at all, and and that's the first thing. So, really, we will say that on the first instance, Islam it passes the test for necessary condition, uh, uh, and Christianity fails, and Judaism does as well, and so does, to be honest with you, Hinduism. Almost all the religion just on this fact fail except for Islam. Almost mm. all of them. The only ones which can be contenders are religions which are not that not that ancient. Yeah. Two, three hundred year old religions or something like that. Yeah. Mm. 
So that's the first thing you've got. The second thing you've got, so this is a necessary condition. Another necessary condition is that there cannot be a a, a theological contradiction in the religion, or B, contradictions within the text itself. Because if there's a theological contradiction, like the Trinity, for example, mm. then how, how are we meant to believe in something which is unintelligible in the first instance? Yeah. Something which is unreasonable in the first instance. So it can't be something like, oh, I believe that uh, you know the cow is God or the man is God. Yeah, Because that already shows it's, it's, it's false religion. Yeah. So Islam passes that test because, as we've shown, the proposition of one God is something which is very clear. And the Quran is the only religious book which even, which even insinuates that contradiction is something which is a necessary condition of a religion. It says, If it was from other than God, they would have found in it many contradictions. Meaning, a book from God is not meant to have many contradictions. Mm. I had a, a recent discussion with, what's his name? Uh, the, what's, his, uh, what's his name? Bartman. 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 And he was like, well, a phone book doesn't have many contradictions. He, you remember that? Yeah. A phone book doesn't have many contradictions. A phone book is not making claims about nature, psychology, spirituality, hmm. eschatology, or anything like that. It's not making any claims about anything like that at all. Yeah. If it was from other than God, it would have found any contradictions. A phone book doesn't make claims about the things that Quran is making claims about. And in addition to that, the phone book doesn't claim to be divine. And thirdly, hmm. we're not even saying that's a sufficient condition. We're saying it's only a necessary one. And that's what I tried to explain to him. But anyway, a necessary condition means a condition which must be in place in order for the thing to be true. And then you have now sufficient conditions. So we, just to summarize, it has to be preserved. It cannot be contradictory in its theology or in its script. And it must, uh, yeah, so in other words, it cannot have any contradictions. And we say now, if we look at the, uh, the sufficient conditions, we, we know what they are. Things like prophecies, things like historical accuracies. Things like linguistic, and this is probably the most marvelous thing of all, hmm. the impeccable language of uh, of the Quran, which descopes everything that has ever been known at that time in the Arabic speaking world. You know, it's something which all the all the people, even those who are most uh, antithetical to the Islamic discourse, yeah. like Al Walid ibn Mughira, had to admit this is not like. Sha'r, it's not the Arabic poetry, it's not like Kohen al Arab, it's not like uh, the, the Saja or any of these things that existed at the time. It's not any like that, that at all. It discopes all of that and it's marvelous to the, to, the, to the extent to which people accused it of being magic. The fact that people accused the Quran of being magic is indicative of the fact that they considered it to be something supernatural. That's, that's, that's the truth. The language was so marvelous. The structure was so precise that they considered it to be something which is supernatural. That's what they considered it. They don't want to explain how. How do you explain this like that and the use of languages like this and the structures are like that? So bear in mind, we were talking about the Prophet, yeah? And, and then you're talking about necessary and sufficient conditions. These are mostly of the Quran. Yeah, well, if, if the Quran is true, so fact of the Prophet is true because he came and said, this is from God. Okay. So one of the things that we're saying is that so you think there's an overlap when answering about the the prophet's validity or the Quran's validity? You're saying they, they can there, be there, 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 there is an overlap, and not only yeah. that, one proves the other, and the other proves one. Okay. So in other words, it's kind of like symbiotic here. Okay. You know, if you can if you can prove that the Quran is from God, and you, uh, and or that you can prove that the prophet is a prophet, then both of them entail the other basically. Uh, in the Quran indicates this in Surah Al Bayna, it says, "Lam yakun al ladina kafaru min ahl kitabi wal mushrikin mufakina hatta tatiyam al Bayna rasul min Allahi yatlu suha fi mutahara." That the Prophet himself basically is a Bayna, is an mm. evidence. He himself is an evidence. His life is an evidence. His sincerity is an evidence. How he lived was an evidence. I mean, just the fact. That, just give you one piece of it, easy one. And there's so many things I can mention, but I'll just keep mentioning one thing. A man who consistently prays. Anything between half the night and th anything between half the night or a little bit below that, for example, yeah. consistently prays that many hours. How are you talking? Three hours, four hours? Mm. If you don't believe in what you believe, why would you do that to yourself? Just one thing about his life. All his wives testify to the fact that he spent half the even the Quran. That you spend half the night praying. Or a little bit less than half. Or even more than half. And you read the Quran slowly. So the Prophet Muhammad lived a life where he put him, himself in danger. He lived, he, he done battles 
where he was himself in the front line. He was praying half the night. He had nine wives that he had to manage at the same time. You know, all these difficulties upon difficulties upon difficulties. He, he lived in impoverished life. He didn't have food and drink for long spells of time. So you think for somebody that wanted wealth and wanted fame and popularity, yeah, all the motivations are not there. Yeah, motivations yeah. are not there. He he lived the lifestyle. Even Amr al Khattab went into his house one time, and he saw him laying on the ground with you know in a, in a bad condition, mm. and he and he said, "I'm going to make supplication to God that Allah makes it easier for you." It's Bukhari, and he said, "I don't want that. That's for that's for these individuals." He said, "Look at the people of Rome and look at the people of Persia." He said, "That's for them in this world, and for me, it's, it's not. It's not like that." So, in other words, his his aesthetic lifestyle, his humble attitude, his um, resistance to be materialistic, or his foregoing of the world—all of these things are very clear-cut evidences of his prophethood. That, in addition to all of the aforementioned that we've mentioned, the the language, the structure, the the prophecies, the history, uh, you know, and his life. And so many other things. Okay, it's clear to us that this there is evidence for Islam being the truth and the ultimate truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, what do Muslims believe about the theory of evolution? It's a, look, the theory of evolution is like many other theories. It's this Darwinian evolution is not just the only uh, type of evolution. There's Neo Lamarckian evolution, uh, evolution by genetic engineering. Evolution, there's different types of evolution. So one shouldn't think that Darwinian evolution is the only one, number one. Number two is, even if we say it is the only one, or whatever, right? I will say this candidly. Islam has no problem with 99.9 .9 recurring percent of the theory of evolution. No issue at all with 99.9%. .9 if I told you Islam has no problem with 99.9% .9 recurring of any theory, you'd say that Islam pr practically allows you to believe in that thing. And that's what I would say about theory of evolution. The one slither, the small thing which Islam does not allow is belief that human beings were created in any other way than a direct way from God. Why? Because the human being has a specialized narrative in the Quran and the human being is so far separated from all other species in this world that it's inconceivable that they are even connected to animals uh, in the same way that animals are connected to each other. Human beings have been specialized by God. Allah, he created human beings directly. Mm. And so this is something we believe is in the narrative of uh, Islam. And there are, if you look at the human condition and compare it to any animal you like, any or uh, orangutan or any chimpanzee or any gorilla, yeah, you will find that no matter how close their gen genes are to ours, you will not bring this this animal, yeah. uh, this gorilla, okay, and make it do calculus. It's far away from doing calculus. We're talking about whether or not they can hold tools or whatever, yeah. let alone calculus, let alone civilization, let alone language, let alone um, communication and leaving things behind, let alone morality, with yeah. all due respect. You can compare a gorilla with a bear. You can't re I mean, you can compare it with a human being in terms of genetics and instruction and anatomy, fine. But a gorilla is more, is more befitting to compare it with a bear. Who will win in a fight, a gorilla or a bear? Probably the bear will win, actually. Mm. The human being is on a completely different level in all these spheres. I think it's also important to know that there's a, sometimes these two things get conflated. One is change over time, which is, Sabur so calls it basic evolution. Mm. Yeah, and we got no issue with this uh, at all. Yeah, mm. there's evidence of things changing over time, antibiotic resistance, and uh, and stuff like that. There's no issue for that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Darwinian evolution has two main aspects, which is natural selection and, and tree of life, mm. and these two things have have issues. And moreover, I'll say something else. I'll say something very important on this matter, which is that human beings. If uh, sorry, in the Quran, mm. we we believe in uh, Isa, Jesus, just like Christians believe in Jesus, right? Yeah. Now, if if I said I believe in Jesus, if I saw if if someone saw Jesus, what would they think of Jesus? They would think of Jesus as a man who has a mother and a father. But Islam tells us that he has a mother but no father. Mm. But that's scientifically really is impossible in, in yeah. many ways whereas it's, it's, it's not impossible but beyond theory or beyond the theory of darwinian evolution yeah 
So the, the, the fact that Jesus does not have a father is something which goes beyond the pale of Darwinian theory. Mm. Because we assume that there's, or well, even biology, right? Because 23 chromosomes on each side, we need a mother and a father. But Adam has no mother and no father. And the Quran says this. That the similitude of Adam is like Jesus that he created from dust and said be and he was. If that is the case, if we can believe that Jesus with no mother was created, even though a Darwinian would say that this person required a mother and a father, then we believe in this kind of metaphysical in, uh, interaction or intervention which caused something which is otherwise part of a chain of something which we'd see as connected otherwise, that wouldn't be. Do you mm. see the point? Next, homosexuality. What does Islam say about homosexuality? Is it intolerant to homosexuality? Is Islam backwards and barbarian because it doesn't tolerate homosexuality? Well, obviously not. Uh, the thing is, homosexuality is defined as like same-sex attraction, okay? And uh, I think homosexuality nowadays is classed in LGBT. So we just put it all under one umbrella. Yeah, okay. I mean, but homosexuality is a sexual preference. It can be a romantic one as well. Um, and so what Islam has to say that about that is very clear, that we believe that sexual activity should be done uh, between male and female, you know. Uh, in order this way, yeah. Yeah, uh, between male and female, yeah. in order to propagate the species, in order to... Um, and we believe also that there's good evidence to show that a male and a female in a nuclear family produce the best, uh, most stable environments, both sociologically and, quite frankly, biologically as well, in the sense that uh, the, it limits the spread of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, if you look at all of the, if, if you look at all the data, homosexual uh, homosexuals in particular are most likely to spread certain disease or uh, to to um, to be infected with certain diseases uh, and this is something which is uh, clear cut and so for for all the different reasons homosexuality is forbidden in islam it's an aberration to the moral uh, framework of islam and so we don't believe in it in fact we have stories in the quran and the na uh, narratives which very yeah, clearly but bear in mind also bro that hmm. these are students in schools isn't it they say this sort of stuff like some people have said we i disagree with it they said no but you must respect them and they go no i don't and then they get kicked out okay so no but we're, student, we're, 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 yeah. we're, okay but w what we're doing is we're spelling out the islamic stance first this is yeah. not our stance. This is the islamic stance okay. just like this it's not dissimilar from the from the say certain christian people who would have the same the yeah, same and stances Jewish, yeah. And Orthodox Jews, and in fact, quite frankly, Sikhs as well. Many other people from different religions. It's not just Muslims, uh, Christians, and Jews. Many other people from different religions, and some non-religious people as well. We have to remember some non-religious people find homosexuality uh, um, an aberration to their own morality. So people have to accept that there is a difference in opinion here. And who who do we mean by people? The dominant population has to accept that there is a difference in opinion and the way that homosexuality is seen, just as they accept. A difference of opinion the way that eating meat is seen okay now i might have some vegetarian friends or acquaintances or colleagues or student friends in the school just like i might have some homosexuals that fit the same profile in the school or in the university or so on uh he might be a meat eater i might be a vegetarian or vice versa mm -hmm. yeah now the thing is we both disagree on the morality of eating meat yet we are able to we're able to respect one another we tolerate one another we're able to understand that i have my way and he has his just being against something doesn't mean again being intolerant or disrespectful or unhospitable that's a very good to, point to to those who carry an opposite belief so just because you disagree with something it doesn't mean that you're going to treat the people that uh, carry those beliefs in a manner that would be uh, disrespectful or unhospitable or so on. It doesn't like mean the that. media, they disagree with a lot of things about Islam. However, are we going to accuse them of being Islamophobic? Exactly. You know. So, just as schools and teachers and uh, you know people in the universities that have position of responsibility and that can and decision makers, quite frankly, as well, just as they allow homosexuals to be free in those environments they should also allow muslims christians jews and others who believe that homosexuality is false they should also allow them to be free in their own beliefs uh, regarding homosexuality 
Because if mm. they don't, then that means that they are being selective and discriminatory. Yeah. And that is what that is the narrative that needs to be put forward. That we as Muslims cannot believe this because of our religion. And if you don't allow us not to believe this, you're discriminating against us on the basis of religion. And curbing and, our freedom of speech. And in fact, in terms of the law, yeah, curbing, there's there's two issues here. There's a freedom of speech issue, which is human rights. Uh, which we're not saying we believe in fully, but according to yeah. the law, we're talking this is a legalistic yeah. issue here. Yeah? Law of the land. Yeah, and because the Human Rights became an act, the Human Rights Act, nineteen ninety eight in the UK, and then you have another issue as well, which is that it's against the Equalities Act, because if that can be seen as if you're discriminatory against a student, a pupil, or um, a colleague or a work person because they have certain views which are different from yours and thus these views are on the basis of religion and they're not something which are harmful to society or something like that which are terrorism or something like that mm. in that case if you're trying to curb or stop or discriminate against those people on that basis there's a good legal basis there for you being discriminatory and potentially that legal action should be taken against you so we need to start we need to start fighting back in we need to know what the law is we need to start fighting back in our lands like would like yeah yeah because at the end of the day why should we be the one bullied why yeah. should we be the one walking in eggshells thinking that well, they're going to put our kids in prevent programs and uh, yeah. social services because we believe in a morality which is distinct and different from theirs we have freedoms as muslims in this country just like jews and christians have freedoms and we we should not be afraid to um to uh, to basically live those freedoms Facts, facts right there. That's right. All right. So in some of these schools, like we had um, these grammar schools, sometimes they ask questions in very crafty ways. Like one of the question is, how do you how do you feel about the fact that there is evidence of other religions other than your own? That's uh, it, it, for us. In fact, the fact that there's evidence for other religions other than our own is confirm is confirmatory of our own religion. Because it is. Yeah, because we believe in previous dispensations which have been corrupted. So that Christianity has some evidence and Judaism has some evidence is in fact an evidence for Islam. Because wow. we, don't, we don't say that Judaism and Christianity are hey, false. You just flip that. Yeah, we, 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 we don't say, we don't have a, a all size fits all a policy on truth. We don't say that we have a monopoly on it either. We're saying that we have the truth, yes, the full truth and nothing but it. Mm. But that other people have aspects of it as well. Now the ideology of aspects of the truth. Every, almost every single human ideology, including feminism and communism, they have some some true things to say. Wow. Uh, so the fact that some people have some true things to say is nothing remarkable in the human condition. And in fact, if it relates to other religions, then all this does is it shows us the extent to which our own religion is all comprehensive in being able to describe other religious traditions as being a mixture of truth and falsehood. How do you feel that the uh, that big bang you've answered evolution but how do you feel that theories like the big bang have evidence to support it i don't think the big bang is in any way shape or form uh even to a degree of one percent or 0 0.1 percent threatening of our theses in fact if anything people have been trying to keep away from the big bang from the atheist circles now especially on the uh, because of the proliferation of the intellectual arguments What's proliferation uh, the spreading of certain arguments yeah. intellectual against the proof of god's existence including but not limited to william lane craig's uh, um kind of uh, kalam cosmological argument that everything was oh, actually from al ghazali but he made it popular in the west which is that everything that begins to exist has a cause the universe began to exist therefore the universe has a cause and the second premise that the universe began to exist the big bang is actually confirms that so if 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 anything, I think that there's been resistance from the atheist and new atheist side to try mm. and to try and get rid of the Big Bang, if you like. Um, like Stephen Hawking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant, good example, great example. A brief history of time. He didn't believe him and Penrose recently yes. as well. Roger Penrose. He recently wrote a paper uh, um, going against what he uh, earlier said about the Big Bang, and and he believes in some kind of a cyclical model. Model now. Even Krauss. He he's nothing he's, he doesn't exist he, do, he, he do, he's, he's not an authority but I'm talking about people that are actual authorities like to be fair yeah. Hawkins and Penrose are serious authorities but Krauss yeah. is, is, is nothing this one's a bit obvious but it gets thrown around a lot BBC question time anytime there's a natural disaster it gets debated anytime something happens and people die constantly I've heard it growing up all the time get debated if there is a God why does he allow evil? All right, a simple way of answering this question 
is and this could be somebody saying yeah that person died that child died oh that person got cancer oh in nature there's this animal it does this and it does that okay so if there's a god why is it evil okay well um first of all the onus or, or the burden of proof is upon the one that's making the claim so the person is making the claim that the evil and god are incompatible with each other has to show how and why because if, if you're saying that there cannot be a god without evil and they cannot be evil without uh they cannot be evil with a god then you have to explain why those two things are incompatible now in the hellenistic age there was an attempt by someone called epicurus to do that mm. but that has been seen as to be redundant because it only has two attributes of god that is kind of uh, mentioned that God is omnipotent is good then if he's omnipotent then why is he letting the good in the world and if he's good then why is he not change uh, why cannot he change the evil in the world mm. so they try and play or Epicurus tried to play off with those two kinds of attributes but in reality we all we, no one I mean the classical theists and so on we don't believe in uh, and and beyond so obviously those who believe in multiple attributes of God uh, like we do we don't believe in God with only two attributes we believe in a God with many attributes including mm. but not limited to the knowledge attribute, the wisdom attribute, um, the pardoning attribute, the forgiving attribute, the 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 justice attribute, you know, the power attribute, and so on and so forth. So God has all those attributes. It's not just has it doesn't just have one attribute. And so, why does God allow X and Y if He's only if He's omnipotent and uh, good? Uh, is because He's also wise. And our definition of wisdom is appropriacy. Anything which is appropriate, which fits the knowledge of God, is something which is uh, wise. Uh, in, in Arabic, what our shape if you make any sahih, putting something in this rightful place. Vulm, interestingly enough, which is oppression, is the opposite of that, which is putting something in this unrightful place. If I were to put, you know, the the, the chair on top of the table instead of underneath it, for example, that would be seen linguistically as a kind of vulm or oppression. So wisdom is putting something in this right place. Now, as Hamza Zulsa says, we see the pixel, but we don't see the picture. Mm. You know, there was a very interesting, uh, I think it was some Indic religion or some like Eastern tradition story and i think this was this would kind of clarify the point a little bit more there's a story of three blind men that saw the elephant i'm not sure if you have you seen this it's a buddhist tale yeah is that a buddhist tale yeah. so one blind man he touched the you know the 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 trunk of the elephant one the ear one the tail yeah. of the elephant and all three blind men were called back and asked what about the elephant and one said it's a very hairy creature the other said very long and the other said the very wavy creature all yeah, three so of one said it's a snake and the other one yeah, said. exactly, because they didn't see the full picture the full of picture. the other. Uh, likewise, we, just because we see certain evil things in our life, we can't see the full p picture of it. We can't see what, why is it that case, why it's happening to me. It's also a logical fallacy, isn't it? Argument from ignorance. That just yes, because, yeah, you don't yes. Know. it's a fallacy of incredulity, it's an argument from ignorance. It's, uh, it's actually a poor argument to begin with. So much so, let's be honest with you, even atheists like William Rowe and others have, in, have declared this to be an intellectually bankrupt argument. William Rowe, yeah. I think that's his name, yeah. Uh, many many atheists now they don't really use this as much I mean to be fair because it's, it's such a weak 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 argument mm. but when I was reading Graham Oppie's book which is um, Arguments for God's Existence very pathetic and small book um, weak in its uh, contents and uh, not not really not really persuasive at all but he he basically was arguing against the arguments for God's existence and he only really offered one argument against God which is the argument from evil or the problem of evil and it shows you how out of ammunition, out of ammunition that atheists, and Graham Oppy really and truly in terms of atheist intellectuals is probably seen as the number one, even though he's not as charismatic in, um, as the new atheist, for example. But he's more intellectually rigorous. And so for, the, for that reason, uh, for example, um, you know, this is the one bullet they can try and shoot you with and it doesn't, it's not even made out of steel. You, I mean, a student going to school and um, this is a good place to kind of wrap up here, I think, yeah? A student going to school, and when the, when the teacher asks her question, you ask a counter question, so it's a very good question, but I think we need to answer this question in order to proceed with yours, wow. which is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is the universe fine-tuned for but human then life? What, what if they ask, why is there something rather than nothing, and they give like a waffly answer? It's not, there is no, there is no waffly answer. Why is there something rather than nothing? Whatever answer you give, whatever answer you give, you're going to have to start conceding to the fact that there's a foundational thing which started the, the entire universe. If you don't concede to that, you will not be able to answer this question in any way in intellectual, uh, a satisfying, uh, intellectually satisfying way. That's the first thing. Second, secondarily, I'll say, the second question, why is the, the universe fine-tuned for human life? Do, do we think that we're here without guidance? Do the human beings think that they were just left aimless? 
Is this a game? Is this is this a, is this life just um, us doing things? Is that what it is? And and these questions, one after the other, they will trigger hopefully your teachers, your colleagues, your friends, your students into belief. And if not, then they may be a lost cause. Quite frankly, they may be a lost cause. There was a very interesting uh, lecture by someone called Khalid Yassin, preacher from a long time ago, and it did so well in converting people. Like person after person after person It's called The Purpose of Life yeah. Do you remember that one? I do, yeah it's Bro, it's, it's, because, it's a classic because It's the question that is Talking about purpose Is so powerful, bro It's one of the most powerful things you can do Bro I genuinely think we have saved a lot of people wow. Inshallah through this video Inshallah Yeah, so it's one video Share it with anyone And everyone that's a student, that's a teacher, that's an alien, that's a, you know, homo, you know. Homo erectus. Yeah, homo erectus. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one, you're yeah. happy when you said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's leave it there, guys. Until next time. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam.